Okay, that was very ins inspirational, I think. We would all agree. So it's my pleasure. I'm actually going to introduce the entire panel at once and they can come on up. Uh, I'm going to start with Mary Leonard, uh, who uh, there's a lot that's actually in the, the program, so I won't read everything that's there. Uh, but Dr. Leonard uh, holds the Arlene and Pete Harmon Professorship for the Chair of the Department of Pediatrics uh, and is the Adeline J. Physician in Chief of the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. Uh, Dr. Leonard got her, did her undergraduate at Northwestern in chemistry, and then she came to Stanford uh, for medical school, so she is an alumnus. Uh, and then she went to University of Pennsylvania for, at the Children's Hospital, CHOP, uh, and uh, as an intern, resident, fellow, then did a master's in epidemiology and biostatistics, uh, then joined the faculty there, and basically was there for 25 years. Um, I think we were all really excited when Stanford managed to get her to come to Stanford to become, actually she didn't come originally as the chair, but as soon as she was here, everybody recognized that this is really chair potential. And I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Leonard and collaborating with her on her amazing work in bone and body composition in both children and older people. Uh, I'm also going to introduce Leslie Subach, uh, who is the Catherine Dexter McCormick and Stanley McCormick Memorial Professor and Chair of Pediatrics, the Department of, I'm sorry, the Chair, the chair of Obstetrics and Gynecology, which is actually also one of my departments, so she's my chair uh, at Stanford. Uh, so uh, Dr. Subach did uh, geology at Dartmouth as an undergraduate and then went to UCSF as a fellow, uh, did her residency there and also got a master's in epidemiology and clinical research. She's a specialist in urology and pelvic um, surgery and is principal investigator of many federally funded projects. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Subach having joined the faculty. Um, on a longer note is uh, Dr. Uh, Suzanne Pfeffer, who is actually uh, had 14 years as chair. So we have some new chairs, relatively speaking, and we have some really long-term experience chairs. Uh, and uh, so Dr. Pfeffer uh, is the Emma Pfeffer Murner Professor of Medical Sciences and Professor of Biochemistry at Stanford. Uh, she did her undergraduate at UC Berkeley. Uh, and then she did her PhD at UCSF and a postdoc at UCSF and then also a postdoc at Stanford, which makes her an alumnus of the, the Stanford Medicine Alumni Association. Uh, she joined the faculty at Stanford and became chair and has been chair for four, was chair for 14 years. She just recently stopped being chair. So what you should realize is that um, that's a really long stint for a biochemistry department to have someone be chair for 14 years. They usually rotate every five years. But it's really because of her amazing uh, eminence. And uh, I talked to many people in biochemistry who think that she was the most phenomenal chair they ever had. So we're really lucky to have these three women leaders. You can all come on up and sit up here. And um, you're going to each tell your story uh, from the chair. Uh, we're going to do one by one. And then afterwards, we'll have a little Q&A. And so. We'll, we'll start with Dr. Leonard because she's to my left. Yeah. I'm not good with left and right, by the way. <laughs> so first I want to thank uh, Persis Strell for the wonderful talk and to help me think through a little bit about some of my nonlinearity. So uh, as Marcia said, I went to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to train. After getting my master's, I ran a large NIH-funded lab for about 14 years. And during that time as a pediatric nephrologist with NIH funding, and you can probably count on one hand the number of people that fit that, I got asked to be to look at division chief jobs all the time at pretty much every major institution. And I never wanted to do it. It just didn't appeal to me. And I, you know, someone said to me, quote unquote, you're being stupid. And they said, you need to go look at these jobs because at some point you may want to do this at your own institution. You need to think about what the potential is and the opportunities. Uh, ultimately, I did look at one quite seriously and then leveraged it into a really big retention package at my own institution. That wasn't my intent, but that is what happened. I said to my husband at one point, I said, I don't have this leadership gene um, because I didn't have this overwhelming desire. I was looking at the men in my field who seemed to constantly be taking these jobs and jostling and moving around the country, and I just thought, that is not appealing to me. And a major light bulb went off over my head when I talked to another woman who had ran an empire in neonatology international clinical trials, and I said, how come you were never a division chief? 
And she said, because when you're a division chief, you are dealing with such a spectrum of different agendas across the entire hospital. And I really wanted to just lead a research program because everybody had the same agenda. Everybody wanted to do phenomenal research and change the field. And I thought, oh, I do want to lead, but I want to lead in research. And so I went to the chief scientific officer at the hospital and I said, if there's ever an opportunity for me to play a leadership role with your team, you know, please think of me. So three years later, he asked me to be the director of the Office of Clinical and Translational Research, which was a very, very big job. It was a very large budget. It was 60 FTEs. Um, and that really was a game changer for me. And I remember when we first talked about it, he said, this will position you well to be a department chair. And I thought, I think shoot me was the phrase that came to mind. <laughs> um, and that was not appealing to me um, at all. So when I came here and within about 11 months, the department chair opened up. Oh, also uh, one of my other mentors who's a dean actually at Northwestern said to me, when we were, my husband and I really very much wanted to get back to Stanford, um, once the kids were out of the house, he said to me, you shouldn't move until you move to be a department chair. And again, that was just not an aspiration. So getting here within 11 months of arriving and really focusing on, writing, uh, on running my lab and writing multiple R01s, um, when the job opened up, I went back to this dean and I said, okay, I'm gonna apply for this job. So we did airport interviews. For people who don't know about how airport interviews are done, it's the first round is done very quickly, but also maintaining a very, very high degree of confidentiality. And I did the interview, and I didn't, don't think it went particularly well, and I went home, and I just thought, there were questions they asked me, like, how do you decide how many pediatric practices to buy in the network? And I remember thinking, well, there's a question where I don't care what the answer is. <laughs> you know? So <laughs> I went home. And I was not happy about the day I had gone. And so I immersed myself in writing a grant. And I can get into the zone when I write a grant where the entire day flies by and it's really fun and you don't realize you haven't peed and eaten you know, in 12 hours. And I said to my husband on Sunday night, I'm withdrawing. Um, re writing science is my passion. This is my happy place and I'm withdrawing. Somebody said to me, uh, David Stevenson, who actually I worked in his lab in the 80s and who was vice dean for many years, said don't withdraw, just hang in there. Where things turned around for me is when I became one of the five finalists, the dean had given, me, had given all of us a real gift because he had done an external review um, of the department. And when I was given that document and I went through and highlighted in yellow everything that was a challenge or an opportunity without fail, every single one of them I said, oh, now that would be fun. That would be fun. And it was very much, a big part of it was around mentoring young people, bolstering our fellowships, uh, helping people launch physician scientist careers. In my leadership role at CHOP, that was a huge amount of what I did. It was a huge amount about creating an environment to, for people to be successful. So that is the pathway. I think it was a little bit circuitous. I'm having so much fun. I think by far the most rewarding part is helping launch the careers of our clinicians who want to do educational or scholarly, educational scholarship or advocacy, you know, not the traditional research as well as trying to just do everything possible to help our physician scientists be successful. There. Well, and before, before I pass it on to our next uh, eminent woman, <laughs> I, I would like to ask you something about balancing the family, because oh, I think yeah. that's a big issue that came up, and I would love to, I know a little bit about you. Yeah, that was, I think, you know, I, it, Persis, you talked about that, that range of time where you don't remember. Um, I think PTSD is another term that comes to mind, you know, um, not only for me, but for my husband. Um, you know, we, we, sometimes when people talk about TV shows and movies and there's this sort of social gap in our lives where we, have, we didn't know any of that, you know, when I talk to women all the time or when there are faculty in my office crying um, about this really big struggle, because I think when you talk about regret, the only thing that comes to mind is you always wonder about the impact of your career on your children. I am very honest and open about how really, really, really hard it is. Because if you aren't, I think that women will say, well, she seems to have this all figured out, and therefore I don't, and so this isn't for me. And so sometimes I'm overly honest, maybe, and when I tell the story about my three-year-old daughter saying something to me as I went in to be on call over the weekend, brace yourself, this is a three-year-old, you love your job more than you love me, that always gets that reaction. <laughs> Um, I had to, I talked to a psychiatrist, for a friend of mine, and she said, that is 100% on you. You are somehow projecting some real ambivalence that is really unhealthy. She would never say that to your husband. And that was when I realized I was saying, oh, I wish I didn't have to go into work. 
the minute I stopped that behavior, I think it was rectified. Now, there is a bookmark she made for me uh, for Mother's Day as part of a preschool exercise that's on my wall in my office that says, loving, beautiful, kind, nurturing, too much kidneys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a, that is a problem. Um, She's you also know, a nephrologist. I'm a nephrologist. Yeah, no, I don't know if I mentioned that. So, you know, it's hard. I think the, the important thing is to just acknowledge how hard it is, to talk about how hard it is. Uh, I'm fiercely proud of my children. They are gainfully employed. Um, and, uh, and I hope happy. I think they are happy. I, I don't know. I think that is really the hardest part. I have to say I have an extraordinary husband who really carried the burden. Uh, I mean, I really felt like we were in this completely together. And, and uh, when I traveled, the house, you know, I do think the home, things were OK. Although one thing I did that worked really, really well is if you have traveled to, you know, what, when I traveled, when my kids were just a little bit older, I always took my mom and one kid especially for international travel. And they would go off and have these great adventures. And I thought, well, at least somebody's enjoying Heidelberg or Madrid or wherever we are. Um, and then they would come home and tell me about their adventures. And then that also made seeing things, things easier. So yeah, it's not easy, but uh, you know, no, no regrets. 100% the right thing to do. And at some point, your kids become really proud of you. Um, although my son once said to me, don't use big words in front of the other mothers. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. There's, there are some funny moments looking back. But, <laughs> but anyhow. Okay. And, and I'll give you a chance to ask her a question later. We're going to move on to Leslie Subak, who I also f failed to announce, uh, introduce the fact that she brought to Stanford a sexual and gender minority clinic and research program. So that has been a really important addition to the faculty. And I think she's very open about her family situation, so hopefully she'll bring that into the, the discussion as well. Great. Thanks, Marcia. Um, I'm going to actually, Mary, I always love hearing you speak. And we actually have some very similar things in our background, but we've come about our, our trajectories differently. But we were medical students together and knew each yeah. other way back when, so it's fun to reconnect. Um, I'm going to start just a little farther back. Um, I went to Dartmouth and was in the fifth class of women admitted to a prior male school, which meant that I was the first class where every person admitted was admitted under co-education. Yet, a lot of the men were very upset about it. And <laughs> it was the day when you had to raise your hand and stand up in class to talk, and I was taking calculus as a freshman. And there were like three women in a class of about 200 men. And if a woman would raise her hand to speak, the men around her would stand up so that she couldn't be seen. <laughs> um, and then it was, I first got there and I thought, what the heck is going on? And it was really fascinating of a time to say, you know what, you know, we are here. It was the strongest group of women I have ever found. And it was really amazing what we all did as individuals. So that, and it's so why I never took that as, you know, you shouldn't speak, this is adversity. I took it as, I am going to have a big, loud voice, damn it, and I'm going to raise my hand and stand on top of my seat to do it. <laughs> and, but not in a confrontational way, just of course I should be here. So that was kind of the start. I was a geologist. I love what I did. I worked for the US Geological Survey. And then my team lost funding because Kilauea in Hawaii was erupting. And we had to use our money for helicopters to map the lava flows. And I thought, what the heck am I going to do? Because I love this job. So I did a very logical thing, I thought. And I went into energy banking in New York City. Um, it was a good old job. At, and I was very, at the time, interested in having a trajectory where I knew I would have a job, I knew I'd be employed, because I put myself through high school and college and needed a job. Um, and while I was there, I was walking to work every day up from the Lower East Side to Midtown, and I walked by this little health clinic, the Chelsea Women's Health Collective, that was actually run by the same group of women who wrote Our Bodies Ourselves, which was transformative for many of us in the room who are postmenopause, because that's what we got in the 60s. That was our only introduction to reproductive health, sex education. And so I thought, this is kind of neat. They're doing like advocacy. They're doing STD prevention, contraception. And no one else was talking about it. And they were out doing it. So I started volunteering and thought, you know what? This is absolutely worth it. I should stop my great job with a lot of security and great international travel and all sorts of fancy stuff. And I should go back to medical school and be a pauper. So I went back and finished all my pre-med stuff came to Stanford for medical school and did research while I was here. Well, I, I did research between 
um, going back for pre-med work and medical school because I thought I have to make this somehow make sense. Why in the world am I going from geology and economics and banking into medicine? So I worked in cost effectiveness, um, decision making, um, and economics, and then brought that into medical school. And I thought, well, heck, I'll continue doing research, which was really beneficial when we were students, because after, I think it was 11 quarters, the tuition dropped to practically nothing, and you got paid as a research assistant. So it was a great way to come out of school with little debt um, and to get great experience. Um, through residency, I continued doing research, and then I realized quickly that the only way I would have flexibility in my job to raise a family was if I had something beside clinical medicine, because if you're in clinic, you're in the operating room, you're stuck, you have to be there. But I built a big research career that gave me the flexibility to do the other things I wanted to do. So I stayed at UCSF for a long time with zero interest in being a chair. I loved what I was doing. I ran a big research program. I ran a small clinical program. But like Mary, I wasn't interested in being a division chief because I didn't, that didn't fit with what I wanted to do and what my, my skills and expertise were. Um, but no one was saying, oh, you should do that so you can be a chair because they were like, well, yeah, this is great. Run this research program and run these education programs. Um, and then when the Stanford position came open, several people had said, you should consider this. And I said, thanks, I'm really honored, but zero interest. I've got, and my family is great, I've, my research, my education, my clinical care is all wonderful. And after several times of saying no, I thought, that's weird, I'm normally a yes person, I should think about it. So I put in a letter of intent, was meeting at the airport with the dean, and I thought, I am not gonna like this place. Here's this like middle-aged, older, white guy, sorry, Lisa, um, <laughs> who is, <laughs> his wife is here, who is um, you know, a surgeon from Hopkins. We are gonna have zero overlap on our Venn diagrams. And in fact, I met him and he knocked my socks off. His three priorities were, number one, increasing diversity and inclusion, absolutely sang to me. The second was building a precision health enterprise from basic to population health, also very, um, I, something I found really inspirational. And his third was increasing collaboration. And I thought, you know what, this, this is a place where I could be. And I have never looked back. I've been so thrilled. I mean, the, our, our co-chairs are amazing. It's a possibility to both advance the careers of junior people who are gonna really be so much better than any of us can ever be. They're so amazing um, to really mentor each of them as students, trainees, and then as faculty, and the chance to really change the direction of programs. As Marcia mentioned, I, one of the things that I'm interested in is LGBTQ plus health. Uh, it's a huge gap um, in the healthcare we provide, and I learned about it from some of my, my mentees long ago, who luckily have now been recruited here and have built a great research program. Um, but you get to do that. You get to be a humanist, you get to care about people, you get to take your values um, and, and use those to actually develop where we're going. So that's the joy that I've found in leadership. And it'll be, it's fun to talk about some of the challenges and happy to do that. But, and, and by the way, I have three kids, one who's here today, she's a freshman wow. at Stanford. Um, and my priority throughout was really making sure that I could be as present in my family as possible. My wife at the time had a really high powered job, so I was kind of the stay at home mom despite my you know 200% job at work. Um, and tried my very best to prioritize my kids and, and really talk to my, my trainees and my faculty of that is the really important thing. And your job will kind of work around it. And I didn't travel a lot because I thought, I don't want to. I want to be at home with my kids and my family. And lo and behold, you still have options and opportunities even if you live your path rather than the path someone else has prescribed. Can I say yeah. one thing real quick because I know Leslie will agree. Persis, you talk about the importance of support systems. One of the very, very, very best parts of this job is that the 17 clinical department chairs are tight. And we meet for two hours every Friday in a variety of contexts, but we are very careful. We look out for each other, and we're very, very careful in speaking or, or united in speaking with one voice. One quick thing about travel, when at one point I was doing a lot of international travel, and my daughter said, why do you keep doing this? And I said, because I need to do it to get tenure. I need to be invited. And she said, why can't you put on your CV that you were invited but not go? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and I will say that 
when she was saying 17, she was talking about the clinical, clinical chairs. Clinical department because chairs. Because we have uh, basic yes, department yeah. chairs as well, which we'll get to in a minute. But okay. I do want to talk about one other barrier that I know you broke, and that relates to uh, spouses and residency programs, because I've heard you yeah. mention that. And I think that would be a valuable thing for people to hear. Yeah, this is uh, my, well, she was my partner at the time and then became my wife and I wanted to be in the same place for residency. And in medicine, there is a couples match. Mm. Um, and so we went to Stanford Medicine and said, we want to apply in the couples match. And they said, you can't, you're not married. And we said, well, we can't be married, that's not allowed, but we want to be together and we're willing to accept the risk of you know, us maybe not getting the residency we want because we're strapped to the other one, but that's what we want to do. And Stanford Medicine actually went to the board and said, we have these two crazy women and they want to yeah. do this. <laughs> and the board gave them some, some runaround and then finally said yes. So we were able to actually do the couples match together. Um, and when we arrived at UCSF, which luckily we got in and that's where we wanted to be, um, we didn't know that anyone else would know about this. And I walked down the hall the first day I was arriving to three faculty members standing there with huge smiles on their faces. And I thought, that's weird, like who's behind, what were they looking at? Um, and they it, like embraced me in huge hugs and said, we're so happy to have you here. And I was still thinking, that's weird, but great, you're wonderful. And two of them actually have remained some of my best friends friends to this day, um, and it was that they knew about the couples match. They were thrilled that they had this like lesbian who was going to come and be with them. It turned out that we had a, a probably 10 to 15 percent of our faculty in OBGYN were lesbian or gay, and it was an incredible environment. But that, um, that open embrace was amazing, and yeah, it was, it, it's, it's fun to break barriers. Yeah. <laughs> So speaking, speaking of breaking of barriers, <laughs> yeah. let's move to Suzanne Pfeffer. And if you could say a little bit about basic science departments, because being a chair of a basic science department is somewhat different. Uh, and I think as a woman biochemist, that probably was also quite a barrier. So the difference in being a chair of a basic science department is that usually you are asked to serve a term of five years. A clinical chair is brought in for life until they decide to retire. And uh, I do want to add that I was part of Dr. Leonard's recruitment. And uh, during that process, it was so clear she was so far above anyone else in that search. Uh, we were really happy to have her as chair. So um, now, that being said, that it's a five-year term, I served for 14 years. Uh, after my first term, I was asked to serve another five, and I said, well, actually, I'll serve three more. Then I took a six-year break. Then it was looking around, well, who's willing to serve and who would be useful, and I was asked to serve another time. So anyway, 14 years, I've learned a lot. The story I want to tell you is I've been a faculty member at Stanford in biochemistry since 1986. I was the first woman hired in my department. Um, I won't tell you what it felt like when a professor took me from behind by the shoulders, presenting me to a visiting woman saying, this is the woman we hired. <laughs> okay, serious. But they were wonderful. They've been wonderful colleagues. Uh, and now these uh, great Nobel laureates are, are uh, uh, some are passing away, some are retiring, some aren't retiring, and they're in their mid-90s. They're a remarkable group of people that recruited me. We have wonderful uh, diversity in our department. I've learned a lot along the way, and I'm still learning. Let me tell you some lessons that I've learned in, in 14 years of chairs and more than 30 years of being a Stanford faculty member. I still don't understand why women are misunderstood. How many people here feel that they are somehow misunderstood? Mm -hmm. I think I agree with, with uh, Persis. I think that we bring something different to the room. And what I learned in 14 years of being chairman is that it's not about your vision for the department, it's not about that. What I bring and what I thought was my most valued skill is I could bring consensus to a room full of guys. Wow. I could get everyone to agree and they couldn't do that and they valued that and that was so important for community. I brought skills in uh, organizing meetings in fields that I was entering that I wasn't in before. I'd bring people together. That was something that the women did and it brought us a, built a support system. And I think, I'll say it, I think we do that better than the guys. Uh, a message I learned in being chair is that you don't need a title to be a leader. This is really important. There are roles you can play in any part of your work without the title where you will be valued and make a difference where you are by inventing a role. I'll give you an example. 
when I became chair the second time around, after lots of experience, our basic science chairs weren't as well organized as our clinical chairs. And I said, we need to do something. So I invented the title chair of the basic science chairs, and I convened <laughs> us uh, without our wonderful dean. I convened us on a monthly basis, and we invited the deans and senior associate deans and others and clinical chairs to come and meet with us so that our, our message was heard, that we acted together as a group, that we built community. You can all do that in anything you do. You can invent an, uh, a meeting, a conference, uh, uh, you can write a grant together, you can, say, you can see a program. And Stanford has been a wonderful place for me because any time that there's been something we wanted to do, we always got support. There was never a question. There was always funds to do whatever it is you wanted to do. You just need to own that, realize that you can do that wherever you are. That's really important. So why are we misunderstood? People, I, I, I was recently at our department research conference and a man came up to me and said, Suzanne, I'm gonna share with you a story. When I first came to the department, I didn't like you. You seemed very bossy. You were always running this and that and speaking out and so on and so forth. And I just didn't like you. And I came home and I told my wife and she said, honey, it's just because she's a woman. He shared this story with me as I'm stepping down from being chairman for 14 years. He said, and, and the man said to me, you know what, I'm, it's absolutely true. So we do have to smile more and maybe we do have to uh, look a little less threatening. Um, I don't know. I live by the credo that we all get what we deserve in the end. Life isn't fair. I think we can all agree, life isn't fair. Some people will get the awards or the recognition or the raise before you do. So stand up for yourself, but I, I do believe, it keeps me going, that we will get what we deserve in the end. Now, Persis also said that we will face difficult decisions in our careers, but that we're usually here because we're telling a happy story. So I'm gonna share with you a challenge because I think we should talk about these yeah. things. It does have a happy ending, here I am, and it's, I've had a wonderful, and continue to have a wonderful career. But a few weeks ago, we celebrated the Lasker Awards for the scientists who discovered and uh, contributed to the research that gives us Herceptin, the drug that helps women with HER2 positive breast cancer fight that disease. My ex-husband is one of those people who received the award, and I'm very proud of Axel Ulrich for his contributions. We were together for 20 years. The reason he's my ex-husband is that when we were on the job market, he was offered a Max Planck directorship, which includes full support for your research and 65 other people till your 65th birthday. It's in the contract. Your 65th birthday is where you sign your name to accept the contract. How could I tell him not to take this? Okay, it's like heaven, and he's German. This is like the peak of your career. So they offered me in Germany a bench in your husband's lab or I could be a professor at Stanford, Yale, or University of Chicago. And I hadn't even gone on the job search formally. What would you do? Okay? It's horrible. So I was true to my passion. My passion has always been, I am a scientist. I want to be the best scientist I can be. And to me, to have a bench in my husband's lab is not my future. Okay? We are still very dear friends. It didn't work. We tried to commute for a long, long time. It was very romantic. We met in various parts of the world. Okay, I'll go see him in a few weeks. He has a lovely wife. But we weren't able to stay together, but I was true to myself. And I needed to be, and I don't regret that decision, but it's a sad one, and it was something I had to face. So let's celebrate him together, and let's not end on an unhappy note. I was true to myself. My research... Uh, right now, we study the molecular basis of inherited Parkinson's disease. I'm a basic scientist. I studied these proteins called Rab GTPases for more than 30 years. And four years ago, they found that my enzymes that I'm a world's expert on are absolutely critical for inherited Parkinson's. So I got the lucky phone call from two other laboratories around the world. We have an international collaboration funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and we're making great breakthroughs. And this is the most exciting time in my research career because we're really beginning to understand how this mutations in this particular kinase lead to inherited Parkinson's disease. So what I want to leave you with is follow your passion. Be true to yourself. Be as good as you can be. 
bring skills to the table that may be different than others in the room. I don't think you should necessarily feel like an outsider, but realize we all bring talents that can be appreciated so that everyone can be working together as a community better and follow your dreams. That's wonderful. I actually know that you've done a little matchmaking too, so that you look out for people in multiple ways. <laughs> uh -oh. So she's managed to get some people from her department together. I, I don't know if I should yeah, say actually, that's true. But anyway, so she has, I know that she's got a reputation for really taking care of uh, other people and advancing their careers, as do every all three of these amazing women. So now we're open to questions. Um, I was asked to be sure we had enough time, and so let's. We 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 ran a little late. Uh, we started a little late, but we will allow for ten minutes of questions. Hi, my name is Argavan. I am a physician. I went here for medical school as well as a PhD in the School of Education. Um, I really appreciate everybody's comments this morning. Um, Twice now we've talked about not being threatening. And as a person who is threatening and intimidating, I'd love to know how I can not be those things. I would like to say, why not be threatening and intimidating? <laughs> um, and you know, I think that it, it's really challenging for us as women. It's something we have to be aware of and figure out how to deal with. People expect us to behave differently and be different kinds of leaders than they expect of men. Um, they, and I, I know of several people who make comments like this. I mean, women will come into my office and say, why aren't you being nicer? They would never go into the, a man's office and say, why aren't you being nicer? Um, and usually I am really nice, so that's, that, it's not that big of a problem. But I think you should be who you are. And the people around you can work with you in who you are. And yes, maybe you're going to be bossy and bitchy because you're a strong woman, rather than, yeah, he's a really strong male leader. But just sort of embrace that and say, I am. I'm different. Um, and we need that diversity. We need different voices. I, I personally think it's OK to be, um, to be strong. But I don't know. Well, Suzanne, you made a point about it. So. Yeah. I think it's really important to be who you are and to be strong, but I think there are ways to present messages where you're, you don't want your uh, message to not be heard because someone closes their ears and puts a wall. And I know it's unfair, and, and it's, but it's the real world, so if there, it, sometimes there's a way to present a hard message by couching it by first saying what you really value. I really yeah. value the fact that you are so straightforward and honest and speak your mind, and that's important for me to do my job. And that being said, or I really, and I so, you're so wise, and I really appreciate your help in addressing a difficult conversation. That'll take their, their whatever the word was. They'll, 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 they'll listen then. Because if, if you just say the hard message, they're not listening. You want them to listen. Hi. I'm a physician and uh, trained in sleep medicine here. My question is, how do you counteract when your male colleagues mansplain to you what your ideas are? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, just in the last couple months has been the first time where I felt like, oh my god, they're mansplaining to me. I don't know what it was if I didn't have the awareness of it or, or if it's just something in this role where it's, you know, I, I think the one or two times when it's happened to me where they are explaining something to me, I turned and said, you don't need to explain this to me. I mean, maybe that's not the best response. Um, so, <laughs> I, you know, but I'm just like, I'm going to shut that down. Um, I don't know. Somebody may have a much more constructive answer to this. <laughs> so, that, you know. I'm thinking to myself, I know just what you're doing, and I'm going to, like, play a different game with you. And then I just take control of the, the messaging and the dialogue that I want. And I find that it kind of stops some of that. It's when there are several men mansplaining yeah. together. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's like, true. you gotta be kidding. Um, and, but I, I think it's very reasonable to then just step in and with a cogent argument or cogent points, say something. And that usually, I try not to let it bother me and just move on with the direction I wanna take things in. I'm Afa Sahoni. I'm an ER doctor, so I'm uh, not an academic at all. But I just wanted to ask your opinion on 
Uh, at what point in your careers do you kind of maybe uh, shared ownership of female mentorship with your male colleagues? Uh, where I work, there's, I'm at that point now where I'm 10 years in and all of a sudden I'm on these committees and I'm in charge of mentoring our new hires and helping with female physician burnout. And what I think is actually healthier for the group as a whole and the hospital as a whole is to have it be led by men and women, um, but at the same time I'm kind of establishing my career path and this could be something that um, could be like my niche or what I do for my fellow ER uh, physicians and physicians in general. I'm just wondering in your experiences, have you kind of seen that you know this is something you own for a while, but then you know that you need to bring in the group or the department as a whole and when, if you've had to ever balance kind of, you know, making it yours versus, versus when to bring in other people in a collaborative way for some of these gender specific issues. You know, it's, I, I really, I've done a lot of mentoring because I really, that's sort of the teaching that I do more than and, and other direct teaching. And I think that I've always focused on women and underrepresented minorities because I, I have an affinity and I think that that's where there's, there's so much more need. And I think it's actually okay to, I have male mentees also, but I think it's okay to be a little segregated and to be someone who says, I really do want to help people who have been, um, who've experienced a different life path and who are different somehow, and that's fine. So, and, and you can kind of mainstream that by, you know, you have whatever mentees come your way, but for me, my mentors have been absolutely critical, and they've been watching out for me. They've helped me. They've given me hard messages. They've given me encouragement. They've opened doors. And I think to do that for others is really critical. And if it happens to be that there are people who happen to be more like you, fantastic. We have time for one more question. So um, I'm Jane Lombard. I'm a cardiologist, another one of those uh, departments that's underrepresented. And I want to, for women, and I want to thank you guys for a, a, you know, just sharing your experience with us. But w one thing I did notice is that, um, you know, most all of you were kind of accidental leaders. I, and I, I, I think that kind of represents, to me anyway, the difference between women and men. Men look at leadership sort of like, you know, a military approach, power, control. <laughs> and I think women, you, you look at it as an opportunity to improve, you know, the organization, your community. Um, am I? Well said. Did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did Marcia just pick you for that? Or do yeah. you think yeah. this well, is Well, I, I would actually say I think there are men who also are looking for opportunities to improve science. So there, yeah. it's not only a woman's thing. And, and also there's intersex people that do that too. So, yeah. but. Can I just, I just want the, the word that struck me right away was accidental. There's an amazing article by Barbara Stoll, who's a dean of School of Medicine, that came out in JAMA Network in January, where she really debunks this idea because she talks about um, the, when you're running a whole research lab, you are a leader. And there are many, many, many ways in which you are leading, um, impacting, having influence, promoting people that aren't evident from a line on your CV. So I, I would say, yes, we're in, a, we're in a place that's very visible now. But I think we've all been leaders through other venues and you know for our entire career. And that, that article I highly recommend. It was really, really helpful for me. And it impacts now when I'm recruiting division chiefs, I get pushback because people say they don't have leadership experience because they haven't been a chief or a director. And I'm like, yes, they do. This is leadership. Right. So Yeah, I agree completely. And when um uh sorry, the I and yeah, sorry about that. I, yeah, you're, yeah. I'm, I'm stunned because you're so right. And when I look at our faculty, pretty much everyone has a title of some sort. Um, and I encourage them to really take that and show the leadership of what they're doing. And Stanford has more leadership training opportunities than you could possibly take advantage of. And a lot of other institutions do as well. So by like en engaging in training, by small leadership from you know being whatever, running your small group to running a research lab to running something bigger, we need to see that as leadership. 
And you know, I started residency with two people out of my class of eight whose st first day of internship said, I want to be a department chair. I was thinking, you got to be crazy. Yeah. I'm going to learn how to like deliver a baby and survive on call. <laughs> yeah. um, and so for, I think for all of us, we didn't start the saying, we want to be a chair. We started being really good at what we were doing and leading what we were doing and trying to understand how to inspire people and how to lead. Um, and that led to these opportunities. So in ways like accidental leadership just sounds like, oh, humdy dum, here I go. And that's not what any of us have, have done. It's been very directional. It's just not been, that's where I want to be. It's, I'm going to be really good at what I'm doing as I go. And, you know, we weren't division, we didn't follow the typical path, which is why I told a little bit more of my story to say it doesn't have to be typical. Be really good at what you're doing, like what you're doing, whatever it is, and you know, and just believe in it with all of your heart, and then things open up. The verbiage is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That was not like, like you said, your colleague. Intentional. Yeah. This is what I'm going to be destined for. Um, and you know, the, 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 the position was there, and you were the right person to fill it, and then you recognized that and said, I got to do it because I'm the best person for this job. That's what I did. Yeah, yeah. And, and I will say all three of these women are amazing, and we. The, I want to give some credit to Dean uh, Miner and to Linda Boxer, who really went to incredible effort to find. They do search for these excellent women, and so right now Stanford has, I think, one third of the chairs are women <laughs> in both the basic sciences and in the uh, clinical it's research. Like high, well, we yeah. just got a new chair <laughs> in Epi, so that's a basic science. So, <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, any rate, I, I think that Stanford is very committed. So, um, in honor of the School of Medicine, which is, you know, really the, what our medical association is, I think we have to realize that we do have a commitment to this, and we have these amazing women. And I chose them because they're amazing. Not, you know. And they were women, so. Yeah. <laughs> and they're also alumni. They're all alumni of the Medi Stanford Medicine Alumni Association. Thank you. So I think we have to end and take a little break now to do some networking, right? Thank you. And um, I have gifts for everybody. Thanks, <laughs>